to go ahead and have a seat. It's great to have you with us today. Uh, welcome to theater number three. This is the new home of 360 Church here at the Shattuck Cinemas. Uh, we've moved here. Uh, we're premiering here today. And uh, we're here because it's simply closer to all the good stuff, like the popcorn and the bathrooms and the doors and child care and our storage closet. So everything about this is good. Uh, we thought it was prettier too. And uh, we especially like the stars that blink by way of LED for your uh, enjoyment. Uh, during the services overhead as you'll see them. So we're so glad you found us here today. Uh, if you've come in looking for the Christianity 101 class, that's right across the hall in theater number eight. And I think they're uh, getting going right now. So uh, we won't be offended at all if you slip out and go over there. Uh, we think that, uh, that you'll enjoy that uh, with Alan Weissenbacher as well. Uh, you know, when you uh, go to school, uh, I've gone to school a lot, more than anybody should. Uh, you look forward to graduation day and the great glories that are going to befall you as soon as your professional career begins. You tend to attribute all the negatives in your life to school, and the positives are all in the future somewhere when you receive a degree and you begin whatever career you choose to launch into. <laughs> That's exactly what I thought. Uh, until graduate school actually ended, it does end. If you just stick with it, it will end for you too. In the name of Jesus, we're, we're, we're trusting in that. <clears throat> I left graduate school and took off into my first job as a professor to inherit a disaster. Uh, when I arrived, I found that the dean of the college had decided that the department I was about to join was so terrible that they were going to shut the whole thing down like closing a college basketball program because of recruiting violations. It was just like that. And they were going to scatter all of us to the other departments where, of course, we were going to be warmly received. Uh, I was a communication professor, and I ended up actually serving a semester as a prof in the theater department. That was my home after the death blow fell. Now, the university had failed to notify me of this reality while I was interviewing for this position. I found out about it at my first faculty meeting after I arrived there on the ground. The dean, the big one, was there and announced that uh, they were decapitating us, and I was left with no idea of what my future would be. And so that whole year became a kind of a nightmare that you really only see in the academic world. Um, academic people, when they drop the hammer on you, they have this way of sounding like, this is what Aristotle would have done. You know, they sound so reasonable. But they can be so cruel and so mean. And so what the big dean did was he assigned one of the little deans, what they call an assistant or associate dean, to ride herd over our department to create essentially a hospice environment while our department was put on life support, and then finally they pulled the plug. This guy's name was Frank, and he was the saddest man I ever knew because putting our department out of existence had not been his call. He hadn't been involved in it at all, but he was the one who was forced to sit by our bedside while we slowly died. And so he would office with all of us in our building, and during his office hours, people would come in one after another, pounding his desk, telling them how mercilessly unhappy they were with the university's decision to do all of this. And so the big dean sat in the big office getting no feedback while Frank was in an office in our building getting blasted 24-7 by unhappy ex-faculty members and students and alums and everything else. So one day I went to see him about my future, as in do I have one or not? And we sat down and we're talking about that issue and out of the middle of nowhere, he starts talking about Jesus. Now he's not a follower of Jesus, he's from a Jewish background and he just blurts out the name of Jesus and he, he looks so, I still see his face in my mind from that day, he, he just looks so sad. He has big dark circles under his eyes and, and he's carrying luggage under there, he's so much fatigue, he's so worn down from being put in this role of having to, uh, to uh, shepherd uh, our department to the grave, if you will, and he says, what, what, what is it with people where all of the all of the great leaders, uh, no one, none of them ever seems to reach retirement. They, they all seem to be cut down in their prime. And he cites uh, Mahatma Gandhi and Dr. King and, and others. It, what's wrong with the world? Uh, almost as if to say, if only one or two of these people could make it through the maturity of their career, uh, rather than having ended tragedy like, say, an Abraham Lincoln, maybe there would be a hope for the planet. I mean, what's, what's, what's wrong with this planet that it keeps eliminating the people who are probably its best hope for making life any better? And actually, what I think he was feeling was that the big dean had martyred him in the prime of his career 
uh, in the same way by putting him in harm's way with all of us. But Frank's question was legit. Why do the great ones never seem to make it to retirement? Why are they, why are they cut down early? You know, an example in our day of someone very influential who had a, a, an early passing uh, would be somebody like Steve Jobs, who is instrumental, of course, in the creation of, of Apple uh, with uh, the other Steve and all of the enormous impact. It would be difficult to name somebody who was our contemporary who had more impact on the technological world uh, than, than he has had. Uh, and, and yet a, a, a sort of a terrible disease takes him uh, at a relatively early age, and yet he's, he's got an enduring presence with us to this day. There's nobody in this room that does not know his name and couldn't tell me as much as is probably in the Wikipedia article about him. Steve Jobs, amazing influence, and then it, it all ends so suddenly. Uh, we'd like to bring you uh, an example of that this morning by way of video in our brand new theater, our very first video. We're so proud to present this to you this morning. Well, he has the beard. He makes an amazing impact on the world. He appears out of nowhere, and then he's cut down in his prime. Is Steve Jobs the Messiah? He seems to have the traits that most people attribute to the individual who we would give that title to. He quits college. He's, he, he's not from any conventional institution. He, he bursts on the scene with some early discoveries. He has a small team around him who helps him with these world-changing discoveries. He, he does things like a, a music player that, that fits in your pocket. Doesn't that thing seem like the size of a brick today? That clip is from 2001-ish in a one minute. I'll tell you why. That thing comes out of your pocket. It has a thousand songs in it. And he, he says, it's going to change your heart. This box I'm creating actually can reach inside of you and change your reality. And uh, the people around the world, we could say to the uttermost parts of the earth, earth are now in possession of the vision that is announced that day on that stage at that Apple staff meeting and he has uh, spared no continent in the extension of his influence and his ability to change people's lives and today even though he's gone he is still with us forever in the form of Ashton Kutcher. 
So is Steve Jobs the Messiah? We're beginning a series of talks this Sunday called Son of God. And it has to do with the question of uh, who would that be? And why does that matter to the way we live, the way we think, and who we are? Let's think about it another way. Let's say you're standing outside a city in the ancient world. The sun is setting in the background. And in the distance on a low hill that the people in that area call Golgotha, which means the skull, there are three crosses. And on these three crosses, Roman soldiers representing the empire that dominates that region of the world and most of the rest of what people knew of as the world in those days have nailed three men. These men are filthy. They're perspiring. They're crying out. They're gasping. They're dying. And they're doing so in the most public method of execution that anyone has ever devised. If you look at those three in the distance on that hill, which one of them is the Son of God? From a distance, you can't really tell. There's no black turtleneck shirt. There's no angels singing. There's a crown, but it's made out of thorns, not out of gold and jewels. Which one of the three is the Son of God? You know, the Romans who dominated the area at the time really favored crucifixion as their mode of execution for criminals and for their political enemies, especially those who tried to create discontent and rebellion against the empire. And they loved this method of execution uh, because it was not only public, but it was incredibly humiliating. You were stripped uh, naked or nearly naked, and every worldly possession that you had was taken away from you. Any kind of influence you had ever done, any person you had ever known would never have anything to do with you. They, they would get far away from you, and you would be killed in this devastating way. They took hours and sometimes days until you died screaming. They loved it because it sent a really simple message. Mess with the empire and this is you. It was meant to deter things by use of capital punishment. One archaeologist wrote this. From ancient literary sources, we know that tens of thousands of people were crucified in the Roman Empire. In Palestine alone, the figure ran into the thousands, and yet the very first human remains of a crucified person were not uncovered by archaeologists until 1968 in Palestine. And when they unearthed these remains, what they found was indications that the Bible's accounts of what crucified people went through were really completely accurate. It was a horrible, public, and humiliating way, not just to die, but to be put to death. Outside the city of Jerusalem, these three men were taken on the same day, dying simultaneously. Two of them would die because they were criminals who were enduring capital punishment, and one of them would die because he was being assassinated by his religious enemies and their Roman compatriots. Which one is the Son of God? Well, in the Hebrew Scriptures, a lot of things are told to us about what the Messiah would do when he arrived. Uh, the Old Testament prophesies, uh, prophecies not, tell us not just that a Messiah is coming, but how that person will arrive, what he will do, how he will act, how he will die, what the conditions of that death will be. And uh, biblical scholars have put together various box scores of these predictions. Uh, one person says, well, let's just take a sample of 44 of them, and that's good. Another person says that the classic account is 351 prophecies about the coming of the Messiah. Uh, others like to run it up to 500. One person takes it to 700. Uh, there are 28 prophecies about the crucifixion by itself, but the number of them that we use isn't really the point. If the prophecies are, if you will, the DNA of the Messiah, the question is, is there a match to Jesus and no one else? Now, you've watched enough forensic procedural television to know what DNA profiling is all about. Uh, if you're a CSI fan, you're almost qualified to be a forensic technician at this point because you've probably seen so many episodes. This is what one forensics website says about DNA matching. It says DNA testing is not 100% reliable, but it's pretty close. In DNA, a match of nine of the 13 markers is considered sufficient to identify an individual. The FBI estimates that unrelated persons sharing the nine markers, the odds are one in 113 billion, indicating how reliable it can be. 
The imperfection of DNA testing arrives from the fact that only a small portion of DNA is tested. While matching may be possible based on a small sample, a small sample is not always representative of an individual's entire genetic makeup. Because of this, testing is often allotted a small percentage of error, often a tenth of a percent. However, this does not present the results of DNA testing from being considered reliable in a courtroom. In other words, DNA profiling is not perfect, but it's good enough to establish identity. Even if our interpretation or counting of how many of the prophecies isn't the exact perfect number, the question is, is it good enough to know which one of the three people hanging on those crosses is the Son of God? Now, after his crucifixion and resurrection, Jesus visited his closest followers, and he said some words to them recorded in Luke 24 that really bear on this question this morning in a really important way, and they are these. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer on the third day, rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. We can assess this match of the Messianic DNA by tracking one word through the Gospels, and that is the word fulfill. We're going to trace that just quickly this morning through the four Gospels, the four narratives of Jesus' life. And uh, Jesus' standard is pretty clear. He says everything has to be fulfilled. In other words, if it doesn't fulfill it completely, this is not the Savior of the world who is in view. This is somebody else, somebody who's close, somebody who may have a black turtleneck on and introduce an amazing device, but it's not really the same as saying everything is fulfilled. So think of these prophecies from the Old Testament not as words written on a piece of paper with a blank after them where you put a check if it happens, but think of them as, as empty spaces waiting to be filled. The word fulfill means to fill, like water being poured into a vessel. So each prophecy is, is uh, you know, nature hates a vacuum. Each prophecy is, is a vacuum. It's a void. It's Fill me with something. Because until the fulfillment comes, those prophecies, they're just a lot of words. But when they come, then salvation and healing and deliverance and peace and reconciliation have arrived from heaven. Now, my dog Ricky gets one cup of dog food every day. He knows this. We read online that that's a dog of his uh, weight, which is about 11 pounds. He's, he's little. He's fierce, but he's little. About a cup a day is all that they get. And, and we made this decision because we were afraid that as he ages, he's still not even two years old, that he, he would gradually put on weight and this would be uh, really unhealthy, bad for his joints, bad for his heart, and just like being a person. So he's on the strict one cup a day diet. And then every day, twice a day, Ricky performs a miracle. He turns one cup of dog food into two cups of dog byproduct. <laughs> How is this possible? Twice a day, he smashes the law of the conservation of mass. He, it's like he's a little furry alchemist or something. He's a tiny terrier miracle worker. And I, I just, I, I, I marvel. I'm the one that drags around the plastic bags. I, I marvel, how is this possible? And then at the end of each day, when his little Tupperware food bowl is empty, which is kept in his house, which is the synonym for the church office, that's where he lives, he comes and gets us, brings us into the office, uses his nose to point us at the empty Tupperware bowl, and that is his sign to us, feed me. And so we get the little scoop, we throw in another cup of, of Walmart dog food, and he starts the entire miraculous cycle all over again the next day. It's, it's, who says there aren't miracles anymore? It's absolutely unbelievable. And what is driving him is the vacuum in the bowl. It's not that we don't have 40 pounds of dog food in the closet. We do. We paid almost $8 for it. It's the vacuum in the Tupperware that cries out to him, fill me up. Because no fullness, no miracle. In the same way, the predictive statements in the Old Testament are like that vacuum. Say, fill me with something. 
Put something in here. When I say this is coming, until it does, it's, it's, it's just openness, crying out. It's the same way that the voids and vacuums in our heart cry out for something. Just something. It's why people are involved in all the crazy stuff they do. It's because of the, it's the vacuums. It's the, the empty spaces that are longing for something to come and fill me. And so the scriptures identify us with, with us in that way because they provide us those empty spaces to be filled by Christ. Now let's consider matching nine of those empty spaces using the DNA number with their fulfillment in Jesus. And I'm going to read these to you from the four Gospels. We're just going to go through them quickly, so don't panic when you hear the number nine. We won't be here till three o'clock or anything like that. Let's find out what happens uh, when these predictions are matched to the life of Jesus. Here's the first thing that the Old Testament predicts about the Messiah. It is that he will be born to a virgin. Matthew 1.21, the angel announcing this to Joseph about uh, his betrothed wife Mary says, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill, to fill up the void of what the Lord spoke by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. That's the first one. Second is that the Messiah is going to spend some time in Egypt. And he, Joseph, says Matthew chapter 2, his adoptive father, rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. Herod was threatening to murder all of the male Jewish babies, and so the family flees to Egypt for safety. This was to fulfill, to fill up, what the Lord had spoken by the prophet out of Egypt, I called my son. Nobody in the first century saw that one coming. The third prediction is that the Messiah would maintain confidentiality. This one's in Matthew chapter 12, beginning at verse 16. After Jesus had healed a bunch of people miraculously, he says this. He ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill, to fill up what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. No Twitter, no marketing campaign, everything done in secret. The fifth one is that he would teach in parables. That's in Matthew 13, beginning at thir verse 34. All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill, to fill up what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. Number six is that he would arrive in a humble way. In the context of Matthew 21 here is his arrival for what we call Palm Sunday, which we'll celebrate next week in the city of Jerusalem, riding on a donkey. He sends his disciples to find this animal that he can ride through the gates of the city. And he tells them this as part of his instructions in verse 3. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them. And he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Number seven is that he would die in a certain way, and that's in John 18, 31. This is during his trial before Pontius Pilate, the Roman official who would turn Jesus over to the religious authorities to be crucified. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death that he was going to die. Here's number eight. His garment would be divided by his persecutors. And that appears in John 19, beginning at verse 23, while Jesus is on the cross. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts. One part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to those who, to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill, to fill up what the scripture would say. They divided my garment among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And finally, number nine, that the Messiah would thirst during his crucifixion. John 19, verse 28 says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all was finished, said to fulfill, to fill up the scripture, I thirst. 
A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch, and they held it to his mouth. These nine, in DNA profiling, we would call them nine loci, are just a representative sample of the hundreds of different predictions that Christ does fulfill. Consider the odds of that. There's one statistical study that finds that the odds of anyone fulfilling even 48 of these prophecies would be 10 to the 157th power. Now, math wasn't my best thing in school. So I looked that up, and it said it's 10, followed by 157 zeros. The number of stars in the known universe on a very conservative estimate and leaving apart all the other potential universes is 10 to the 24th power. And so what Jesus has done, it's, it's a miracle in and of itself that all of these nine messianic points of DNA, if you will, match with all of the other traits and no one else has that match. You know, those aren't really my words. There was a Roman officer who was there that day on that low hill outside of Jerusalem who watched as Jesus died on the cross. And as he walked by, he recorded in Matthew 27, verse 54, this way. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake, that's what shook the place as he's dying, and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. See, just as the scriptures are filled with these statements of emptiness, this void that is longing to be filled, our, our hearts and lives are filled with the same kind of thing, looking for something, looking for someone, looking for some, some cure or some approach, some way of, of, of changing uh, everything that's within me when I don't seem to have the power to, to change. You know, every human being's DNA is exactly identical to every other human being's DNA up to the point of 99.9%. .9%. There's only a 0.1% difference. And so in the same way, Jesus is completely identifying with us. And yet there is this crucial difference. God, God can hide in such tiny little places like a baby in a manger. He's among us this morning by the power of the Holy Spirit to fill whatever void, whatever need, whatever struggle, whatever challenge that you have in your life. Lord, we ask you to come now among us in strength and in your mercy and in your grace that you do things within us, Lord, that we are just not able to do on our own. Our hearts, our minds, we have empty places in us. We have places of real struggle where there is nothing in the world around us that offers the solution that we need. We have voids in us that we search around looking for ways to fill those things up, God, but there's just nothing here. There's no asset that's going to fill those things up. Lord, we ask you to come now and in your mighty name and just touch everyone who feels that this morning, God. Just touch everyone who feels that this morning. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to ask you this morning if you have just an area or a place in your life that you just really need God to come in and help you with. Just to do something brave and just stand right where you are. And by doing so, you're saying, Lord, just help me with this thing. Help me with this thing. Even if it's as mundane, it's just a financial need, but just something that you look around in the world around you, just, you just don't see any way to solve this. Just stand right where you are. Just stand. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Our, our worship team is going to come and lead us in, in, in some song. Uh, and as we do, uh, if you have that need uh, this morning as, as the music begins, uh, just take a step or two out into the aisle, and we're going to come to you and just pray with you individually today. We're not going to do anything that is going to make you uncomfortable, but uh, we just want to make sure that you don't leave without somebody at least taking you by the hand and 
and saying it's, it's going to be okay. So, uh, so if you're standing, if you just move out to the aisle, just take one step out and we'll come and pray with you. We'll ask our prayer team to do that. And uh, if we can, everybody else just stand with us. Uh, we'll uh, continue with our worship.